And yeah, so today we're gonna we're gonna get through. I would say the vast majority of the apology. We'll probably have to leave a little bit for next time, but we're gonna get through most of what I would refer to as the defense. So Socrates is defending himself against these charges. Uh, let's sort of remind ourselves what the charges are. He's being charged with uh, impiety, so he's not respecting the gods of the city, and he's corrupting the youth of Athens. And so those are the charges being leveled against him. The dialogue begins with his distinguishing himself from his accusers by his manner of speech. We covered that last time. Remember, he said that they spoke persuasively, even though nothing they said was true. He, sp but he speaks the truth, even though sometimes what he says is hard to accept, and maybe they don't want to hear it. Maybe it's not that persuasive. Uh, and, and so after he gets that out of the way, we, we, uh, we hear this story of Socrates. And in a way, this seems a bit like of a distraction. And, and we're going to come back to this point in a minute once we're done looking at this, uh, this, this investigation. We talked about it last time. We got a good start on it, but what's the gist of it, right? He hears he hears this wisdom. He says, "I heard I, I I became aware of a certain kind of wisdom." My friend went to go visit the oracle. The oracle was asked, "Is there anyone as wise as Socrates?" And the oracle replied that no, there are none wiser than Socrates. And so, how does he react to this? According to him, he's humbled. He doesn't seem to think this must be true. There must be some deeper meaning. How could it be that I, Socrates, am the wisest? I'm quite aware that I'm not wise at all. So what does he do? He goes around seeking out those. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. I live by a very busy street, too. So you hear all these like race cars driving by every once in a while. So apologies for that. Chainsaws and race cars today are the sound effects for this lecture. Um, so anyway, so Socrates hears he's the wisest. He's, he's, he's dumbfounded by this revelation. He knows it has to have some truth to it because it, the oracle, you know, is speaking for the god Apollo and the god Apollo loves truth and he wouldn't miss, misspeak and all this stuff. Uh, but he knows that often the oracle speaks in riddles. So he goes seeking out those who are considered wise. Uh, and there are these three groups who he attacks. I don't think we really got into the details of each separate encounter. I think we might have got as far as the politicians, but I, I'll, uh, I'll cover it again, I'll repeat it a little bit. But he basically goes to all three groups, the politicians, the poets, the craftsmen, and he's, he's there to seek wisdom from all these men. And what results? What happens when he goes to talk to them? Does he find wisdom? What basically does he realize? What is it about them that makes, what makes him smarter? What makes him wiser than these individuals he goes to question? He realizes that they, they are wise, but they think they, they think they know everything and that they, things that they don't know, they, like lie and they say that they know about it or whatever. So he finds out that you're wise when you know you're wrong, basically. Right. And, and I, I don't know if it's completely fair. I would say probably it's true that some of them are lying about knowing what they're talking about. But I think he's a bit nicer to them. He's just sort of like, they don't even know they don't know. They think they know certain things. And they're not even aware of their own ignorance. But I would, I don't know, I'm assuming though in the, in the, in the case of the politicians particularly, uh, they probably know that they are full of crap. They're just saying what the people want to hear or whatever, right? So, but the bottom line is, as you put it, uh, he knows he doesn't know something. He doesn't make a claim. He's aware of his own ignorance. Whereas they make these claims to all sorts of knowledge that they don't have. So let's... Um, Let's find this passage here. I think I read this last time at the end of class. We can start, we'll begin here uh, and pick up where we left off. This is on page number 26. If you have the PDF, the handout here, page 26 there at the top corner. 
uh, just about a third of the way down, not even that long, not even that far down. He says, as a result of this investigation, oh wait, I'm jumping too far ahead. That's that's not the passage I wanted to go to. Let's back up. Um, or is it? Maybe that is what I wanted. Sorry. No, it's, uh, yeah, it's on page 24, so a couple pages back. Um, and again, I, I'm pretty sure I read this last uh, class, but let's repeat. He says, um, pretty close to the bottom of page 24, he says, consider that I tell you this because I would inform you about the origin of the slander. So, and maybe this kind of answers a question I'm going to come back to in a minute. Why is he telling us this story? Why is he bringing up all this? He's on trial right now. He needs to be defending himself against these charges. He needs to be defending himself against impiety and corruption of the youth. What's the point of this story? Um, in a way, he's sort of giving us a hint here of his, of his strategy. Why is he bringing this up? Well, he's telling us this because he's informing us of the origin of the slander. Why, why do they have these bad things to say about Socrates. He didn't do them. He's claiming innocence, but he realizes that it started somewhere. Where did it start? And, and so he says, when I heard of this reply, when I heard that the Oracle said that there were none wiser than me, I asked myself, whatever does the God mean? What is his riddle? I'm very conscious that I'm not wise at all. What then does he mean by saying that I am the wisest? For surely he does not lie. It is not legitimate for him to do so. For a long time, I was at a loss as to his meaning, and then I very reluctantly turned to some such investigation as this. I went to one of those reputed wise, thinking that there, if anywhere, I could refute the oracle and say to it, this man is wiser than I, but you said that I was wisest. And then when I examine this man, there's no need for me to tell you his name. He was one of our public men, right? So now he's talking to the politicians. My experience was something like this. I thought that he appeared wise to many people and especially to himself, but he was not. That, that There it is again, that distinction between appearance, appearing wise, being persuasive, but not really being right not not real not not on, on, on at the bottom being actually deceptive i then tried to show him that he thought himself wise but that he was not and as a result he came to dislike me and so did many of the bystanders so i withdrew and i thought to myself i am wiser than this man it's likely that neither of us knows anything worthwhile, but he thinks he knows something when he does not. Whereas when I do not know, neither do I think I know. So I'm likely to be wiser than he is to this small extent, that I do not think I know what I do not know. After this, I approached another man, one of those thought to be wiser than he, and I thought the same thing. So I came to be disliked both by him and by many others. Okay. So, um, so he, he's, he's going to talk to these politicians. They appear wise to themselves and to people that are standing around there. And then he goes to question them. And what happens? Uh, he, he finds out they're ignorant and he tries to correct them. And they start to dislike him. They don't like hearing all this. Uh, and so he moves on, right? He, he's not going to change their mind. He, he realizes, okay, well, at least I don't uh, think I know what I don't know. And, who does he go to next? He goes to the poets. And what he's referring to as a poet here, I think we, we discussed this last time I talked about it, is much broader than uh, what you might have in mind today. You know, uh, in, in ancient Greek, poesis is to create, to bring something forth. And so it's a very broad term. Really, we're talking about creative types, artists, playwrights, actual what you would think of as a poet like Homer. So he he goes to these creative types and he has a similar experience, but he's very disappointed. He's going to talk to them. He's, he reads some of their poems and he realizes that their poems actually, all these creative works 
do have wisdom, right? They are filled with, with wisdom. But what happens when he goes to talk to the poets and he, he asks them about their poems? What's the experience he has there? He says, hey, he, uh, yeah, go ahead. He realized that um, they were they were trying to uh, talk about things that they didn't know of other than poetry. Yeah, well, I think that was that's kind of a a common theme amongst them all, except for maybe the politicians. It seems like they have some sort of talent or they're good at something. And they try to overextend that. That that gives them confidence, and they overextend their their skill in one area, and they they assume that it applies to all these other areas. I think that's more appropriate of a criticism, though, of the craftsman. It's that. I mean, I I think you're right. There's there's something to that. But the poets seem to like. Um, they don't even really understand their own poetry. Sort of what he says. He says something like. Um, people that were standing around could explain these, these guys' poems even better than they could. And um, that's kind of weird, don't you think? Like, you know, if, if you were like, I don't know, talking to somebody who was a singer, songwriter, or some sort of poet or writer, and, and you were familiar with their work, and you thought that it was filled with all these deep, philosophical truths and so you went to go talk to them about it and you try to discuss it with them and they were like kind of idiots and they were like uh what do you mean i don't know what you're talking about i i just wrote a story that i thought was interesting i i didn't think about the moral implications like i didn't even think there were moral implications i just i thought that was a cool character and i just wrote about him and you're like no but it, it tells you all these things about life and human condition and they're like uh I guess. And that, you know, like, what would you think? You'd be like, what? did you get somebody else to write this for you or something? You know? Uh, but what does he say? He says, well, they obviously don't write their poems with wisdom because they can't even explain their own poems. So how do they write their poems if they don't write them with wisdom? How is that possible? This is on page 25. About halfway down, he says, after the politicians, I went to the poets, the writers of tragedies and dithy rams, little folk songs, uh, and the others, intending in their case to catch myself being more ignorant than they. So I took up those poems with which they seem to have taken most trouble and asked them what they meant in order that I might at the same time learn something from them. I am ashamed to tell you the truth, gentlemen, but I must. Almost all the bystanders might have explained the poems better than their authors could. I soon realized that poets do not compose their poems with knowledge, but by some inborn talent and by inspiration, like seers and prophets who also say many fine things without any understanding of what they say. The poets seem to me to have had a similar experience. At the same time, I saw that because of their poetry, they thought themselves very wise men in other respects, which they were not. So there again, I withdrew thinking that I had the same advantage over them I had over the politicians. So you're right, Shelley, that, that last, like the second to last line there, right? Because of their poetry, they thought they were wise in other respects. So yeah, in a sense, you're right. Yeah, they thought because they're good at that. But but also, what else? He says that they don't really compose their, their poems with knowledge, but how? With what? If they don't do it with knowledge and understanding, how else do they do it? What does he say? Inspiration. Yeah, inspiration, inborn talent. They just get this emotion that they jot it down in a poem, and they don't even really know what they're saying and it just comes out really pretty sounding or something i guess it's like they're doing it for the uh attention or the maybe. Um, yeah. yeah maybe they're just entertainers yeah. and they're like that yeah. sounded cool you know like i just said i just wrote I, I i forgot who it was but um Maybe it was Leonard Bernstein. There was this classical music. Uh, he was a, a, a conductor, composer. Um, 
when the Beatles got really big in the early 60s, I want to say it was Leonard Bernstein, but he was like analyzing their music and like their chord structure and all this stuff. And somebody interviewed John Lennon or Paul McCartney about it. And they were just like, you know, they were talking about, oh, you're using a inverted this and a, this sort of chord progression. And they're like, I guess, whatever, you know, I don't know. I just wrote a song that sounded good, you know, it sounded good on my guitar, you know. Um, so it seems like, in a way, you could argue that that Socrates is putting forth a standard for knowledge, and um, that and and it seems to me pretty intuitive that if you want to call someone wise, that they would kind of have to know, like even like if you're saying, let's say you you're able to say a lot of things that are wise, you're able to recite a lot of things that are wise but you have no understanding what the hell you're talking about. You just memorized a bunch of lines. Does that mean you are wise? I would say no, you know, that seems kind of intuitive. Um, I could memorize a speech on how to perform brain surgery, for instance. And I could, you know, I could give you a lecture on brain surgery, just memorizing. But I might be using all sorts of terminology that I don't even understand, all this medical terminology. So it's like, if I don't understand it, I'm not a brain surgeon. Um, Jacob wrote in the comments here, to be wise means to apply the, the quotes in that as well, I think. Uh, when you say the quotes in that, I guess you mean like what's being said in the poem or... Or, or I guess if I'm giving us a lecture on brain surgery, what's actually being said in the lecture. Yeah, so, and this is something that, I, I don't know, I, I, I want to push back a little bit on it. I think there's, there's definitely a lot of relevance to the point he's making here. But on the other hand, there might be other kinds of knowing something or knowledge where you might be able to, like, for instance, you might be able to do something really well without being able to explain it. Um, you know, you might have some professors who are really, really good at their field, but they might not be that great at teaching it. You know what I mean? Like, they might be published in all these journals and, like, cutting-edge chemists, and they, you know, they're a PhD, and they've got all these, like, scientific discoveries, but they're not very good at explaining it to other people. Um, so I think maybe, maybe, maybe I'm being too, uh, nice to the poets and I'm giving the poets too much credit, but maybe they have such a deep understanding that like Sati's, I doubt that's what's going on here, but I'm, I'm really trying to help them again. Um, I was, I was kind of, I don't know if I was, it was this class or one of my other intro classes, but I was, I was thinking about this issue from another angle that was a little bit more modern. And I was thinking of, well, isn't some art open to interpretation? There's some artist who might write a poem or might, you know, write a screenplay or, a, you know, something like this that they don't want to get tell you the meaning. They want you to sort of just leave it up to your imagination. Hey, it might mean something to me, but of course, this is maybe a bit fair, unfair uh, to Plato. Ancient Greeks, they thought of art, at least from what we can gather from what, what survived from, from their writings, they all seem to think of art in general as a kind of copy. It's, it's, a, it's a form of mimesis. Uh, maybe I should write that here, that Greek term uh, in uh, parentheses. Mimesis, literally to mimic or to copy something. You might be familiar with... Uh, the uh, expression that art imitates life. And so for Plato, if art imitates life, if art is an imitation, it's a copy of what's true. It's a copy of what's real. So it's removed from what's real. It's removed from what's true and therefore deceptive. It may appear, there's that appearance versus reality again. It may appear to be good and persuasive, but it's not. So I think Plato and perhaps Socrates, who knows, he, you know, he's just this character. They seem to have a bias against artists. They thought artists were kind of naughty and deceptive to begin with. And, and uh, but, you know, 
I want to be a little bit fair. There's a bit, there's a bit of an intuitive pull here, and I think it's a pretty strong argument. Look, if you if, and most of my colleagues, I remember in grad school when I was a philosophy major, when I was you know getting a, getting my master's in philosophy, um, a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my fellow students, you know, when we were discussing readings and philosophers that we were studying, um, if we couldn't explain it to someone else in a very clear way, it was sort of, we were accused of not understanding it. It was sort of like, if you can't explain it to somebody else, then you don't understand it. I'm kind of skeptical about that. I think that might be true of certain things, but um, again, you might have a certain know-how or a certain skill, a certain, you know, you might be able to play, like for instance, you might be able to play the violin very well, but you wouldn't be able to teach someone else how to play the violin. You might not have the patience or, or whatever, right? Anyway, I think I'm, I'm spending too much time on the poets. So I'll move on to uh, the craftsmen here. Who are, they're, they're, they're the last group who Socrates seems to want to harass and seek, seek out wisdom from. And kind of what Shelley said about the poets earlier, I guess, applies to them. They think that they're because they're so good at their craft, they think that they have knowledge of just everything, but they're sorely mistaken. Um, but I would say though, out of all three of these groups, they probably get the least amount of criticism from Socrates and the most amount of praise. I think he actually does say some good things about the craftsmen. What does he say about them? Does he learn anything from the craftsmen or no? Well, even if you didn't do the reading, what do you think? If you hung out with the craftsmen all day and asked them questions, you think you would learn something from them? Um, it, was it the uh, that they were good at what they did? <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, yeah, whatever their, their tech, well, and I got this word in parentheses here, techne. I don't know if I explained that term last meeting. But uh, they were good at their techne. They were good at their craft. And so mm -hmm. obviously, if you hang out with someone who's a blacksmith all day, you're going to learn a little bit about blacksmithing. And if you hang out with, I think he mentions the, the shipbuilders, you're going to learn a little bit about building ships and all this sort of thing. Someone's talking about hackers in the uh, comments. Christy, I think. Um, I don't know if I would learn anything from watching hackers all day, but I think you were talking about she says that hackers aren't really good at explaining, even though they're good at hacking. Yeah, just like the poets might not be good at explaining their poems, but they still have this deep, you know, who knows. But yeah, the craftsmen, um, they think because they're so good at their skill that they just know everything. I always talk about, I always pick on um, uh, my ex-brother-in-law, I guess is what I'd call him. He was sort of uh, arrogant about, uh, just in general, he's just sort of an arrogant guy. Uh, and I think he sort of has this kind of psychology where, because he's so good at computers. He's not a hacker. I see all these comments on hacking in the, in the chat box. But uh, he was a, a Linux network administrator. And I remember like talking to him about anything, like how condescending he would be and, and just, uh, and if he didn't understand something, he would typically just dismiss it as not important. He'd be like, why would you even learn that? That's just dumb. Um, but I think we're all susceptible to this sort of arrogance. You might become this way. Everybody has this, once you get really good at what you do and, and maybe, or even just once you start to specialize, you know, wait till you're like junior, senior in college and you're taking nothing but upper level electives and hanging out with you know, maybe you're a psychology major, so you hang out with nothing but other psychology majors or your math major. And you're using all this jargon and terminology that only you understand. And you start to make your, you know, you start to think you're like smarter than you are or something like that. Or we tend to also, I, I remember working at Whole Foods, people tend to, um, they overestimate the importance or I don't want to know if importance is the right word, the difficulty of their, of their position um, I just remember work, working at Whole Foods. I was there for almost nine years and I worked mainly in the meat department, but I'd filled in since I worked there like nine years, I'd, I'd filled in shifts here and there when they were shorthanded on the front end or in the kitchen and the prepared foods and grocery, but, excuse me. 
like I basically worked every position that was there just to, you know, but it was funny because I, so I had friends in all these different departments and it was funny because everybody that worked there thought that they had the hardest job or like the most important job or both like the hardest and the most important job. Like even the, the baggers, the, you know, the butchers, like no matter who. And I think like the craftsmen, they seem to have this sort of psychology because they're so good at their skill and, and, and they're focused on that. They, they sort of elevate the importance even though, you know, obviously building and making all this stuff must be an important role in the city, but they think just because they know how to uh, cast iron that they should be able to be the ruler of all of Athens or whatever. Um, and so they had this arrogance, they had this arrogance. And so we, we kind of come back to the same point. Uh, Socrates, at, at least he claims to be humble some people think he's not really humble and he's he's actually kind of a arrogant guy himself and he's just pretending to be he's just sort of being a smart ass and he really thinks highly of himself uh but if we take him at his word uh that you know what the oracle meant was that he's humble unlike these men who he questions he is aware of his own ignorance and so therefore that is what the oracle meant and he kind of sums this up i guess this is like uh if you would, if you're looking for a moral of the story, you'd find it here on page 26. This is the quote I was going to start with, but now we're finally there. Let's look at this. This is, like I said, about a third of the way down on page 26. He's sort of wrapping things up and telling us the moral of the story. Right? What did he learn from his investigations? He says, well, as a result of this investigation, men of Athens, I acquired much unpopularity of a kind that is hard to deal with and is a heavy burden. Many slanders came from these people and a reputation for wisdom. For in each case, the bystanders thought that I myself possessed the wisdom that I proved my interlocutor did not have. Yeah, that's kind of an annoying thing. I, I need to learn how to like, just sort of let things just stand. I, you know, philosophy majors, philosophy professors, we're, we're often considered like the really annoying guy at the cocktail party. It's like, we're always like, you know, why do you believe that? Why do you think that? You know, sort of picking apart people's beliefs. And sometimes I find myself in situations where I'm like, I really don't know the right answer, but I know your answer is really stupid and simple. And, but sometimes you just got to shut up and just bite your lip and let people be, you know, it's, you got to pick your battles, I guess. But he's sort of saying, you know, what they, they, they assume that because he's pointing out the flaws of their, of their arguments. You know, he's asking them what is justice and they, they can't give him a good, straight, consistent answer that they assume that he must have all the answers that he must have all the wisdom, but he doesn't, he just knows they don't either. Um, and he says, what's probable gentlemen is that in fact, the God is wise, right? Apollo is wise when he says that I'm, that there are none wiser than me. The God is wise. And that his response meant that human wisdom is worth little or nothing. And that when he says this man, Socrates, he's just using my name as an example, as if he said, this man among you mortals is wisest who like Socrates understands that his wisdom is worthless. So even now I continue this investigation as the God bade me. And I go around seeking out anyone citizen or stranger, anyone whom I think is wise. And then if I do not think he is wise, I come to the assistance of the God and I show him that he's not wise. Because of this occupation, I do not have the leisure to engage in public affairs to any extent, nor indeed to look after my own. But I live in great poverty because of my service to the God. So, there's a couple, there's quite a few things we could get out of this passage, but a couple that I really want to make sure we get. One is his summation. What is the moral of the story? Why is it that uh, Apollo, through the oracle, revealed that there are none wiser than Socrates? Well, he's kind of saying there's nothing special about him. We could all be just as wise as Socrates. All of us could be just as wise as him. All we have to do is realize how stupid we are, <laughs> basically, right? Uh, or how does he put it? We have to realize that human wisdom is worth little or nothing uh, when compared to the divine wisdom. 
what's he doing here though? Why is he taking all this time? I mean, you, you could argue he's, you know, this is about a third of the way in. There's not much left of his defense. Why is he spending so much time telling us his story? How, how is this a defense against the charges? Remember the charges, impiety, corrupting the youth. How is he defending himself? It's not obvious that he's directly, a, well, maybe it is, at least I would argue it, he is kind of addressing one of the charges. It's not super obvious. But what do you think he's doing with this story? How is it, is this helping him at all? Is this a, a legal strategy that's worth, I guess obviously he says, I don't care about being persuasive. I just care about telling the truth. But obviously there's some intention behind telling the story. Is, is, this, is this at all gonna establish his case that he's innocent? I, I think he's getting at that his intentions were um, altruistic and not, not meant to insult anyone. Right. And what were his intentions? What, what, was the, what was his whole purpose behind doing what he did and going around questioning people? Um, well, because he, he thought the oracle was incorrect. Right. Well, he, um, thought, he thought the oracle, you know, again, to say it was incorrect might be blasphemous. Like, that's like not believing the God. But he thought there must have been a deeper meaning. You know, so he's got to go oh, look. Yeah. Yeah, he's got to go look. What is, what's the riddle? What does it mean? Um, so how is that a defense against the charges, or at least one of the charges? Which of the two charges do you think that kind of addresses? So he's going and investigating because the oracle told, said that there were none wiser. And he took it serious, but he knew that there must be some deeper meaning. So he, he felt like he had to go investigate. And so I'll, let me read the passage I, I read again to give you sort of a clue. He says, even now I continue this investigation as the God bade me. I go around seeking anyone, citizen or stranger, whom I think is wise. And then if I do not think he's wise, I come to the assistance of the God and I show him that he's not wise. And because of this occupation, I do not have the leisure to engage in public affairs to any extent, nor indeed to look after my own, but I live in great poverty because of my service to the God. So what's he saying there? How, and now he's, he's kind of characterizing his investigations in such a way that it's not like he's just going out there he, for his own curiosity. The, the number one, the impiety. Yeah, he's he's not, like, yeah, impiety, yeah. So he's addressing that. Yeah, you're right. He's addressing that charge, right? They're saying you're not being pious. He's saying I am being pious. He's saying, you know, I'm actually, in fact, I'm, uh, how's he, how's he put it? I'm neglecting my, uh, uh, I'm not able to look after my own and I'm living in great poverty because of my service to the God. So I like I, sacrificed it himself. Right. Sort of. Right. Exactly. He doesn't have time to like take care of himself. He's got to go around questioning people and revealing to them how stupid they are right? <laughs> for, for Apollo's sake, pretty much, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's the most direct defense that you can get out of this, but also what else do you think he's doing here? I think there's a sort of, I mean, what, what, what's gonna happen to some guy like this who goes to all these politicians the poets and the craftsmen who all have a fair amount of, of influence and power in the city. What is he, what's going to happen if he goes around making them look like fools in front of everybody? You know, he goes, he goes to these politicians while they're making their speeches, you know, they're at their big rally and everyone's cheering for them go senator yay we love you and he's like i promise when i get elected i'm gonna make all this good stuff happen and then socrates shows up and he's like really how can you do that how are you gonna make that good stuff happen and he's like we're gonna do this and that he's like yeah but how are you gonna do that that's not even legal you don't have the power to do that if you're a senator uh well yeah we can we'll change the constitution well if you want to change the constitution yeah. And, and then everybody's like looking at him and, and now he looks like an idiot and everybody's like, 
really mad. And, and so if Socrates goes around doing this, um, yeah, Christy in the, in the comments, she says, well, most of them are going to want to retaliate. So I think what he's doing with this story is one, I think, you know, Shelly got it right, you know, nailed it right on the head. He's saying, I'm being pious, right? I'm like actually doing this as a service to the gods. And in fact, at much cost to myself, I'm doing this. And also, these guys are not saying all this stuff because I actually did it. They're not saying I'm impious or corrupting youth because I'm actually doing it. They're just saying it because they don't like me. I made them look foolish. I made them look silly and they're mad at me and they're retaliating, me, you know? And, and so I think that he's, you could say establishing bias in his accusers with this story. So um, that's not the end of the um, defense though. You could say that uh, after this, there's a section um, of cross-examination. He's talking to uh, Melitus, who is one of his accusers. And um, he asked Melitus about the second charge of corruption. He says, well, this is a pretty serious charge, Melitus. You say I corrupt the youth. Um, would you please tell me, right, since you're such an expert about corruption, uh, and you know that I'm, I'm someone who corrupts the youth. Well, why don't you explain to me who is it that makes them better? Who is it that improves the youth, right? And what does Melitus say? Who got that far in the reading? What is Melitus's response to that question? Who improves the youth? You say, I, I corrupt them. But who, imp who is it that improves them? Who makes them better, according to uh, Melitus? It's not, a, it's not an easy answer. Melitus kind of won't give him an a straight answer. Socrates has to kind of pull it out of him. Uh, but what does he eventually say? No one remembers this from the reading? Was it society? Close. Like, his first response is... Uh, <clears throat> what does he say? The laws. He says the laws, the laws improve the youth. And Saki says, I didn't say what I said, who, like what people improve the youth. And so he, he points to, I think he starts with the jury. He says, how about all the people on the jury? Do they improve the youth? And Melitus says, yeah, they all improve the youth. And then Saki says, really all of them? Okay, well, how about everybody else that's here? All the people that are assembled here today to watch the trial. Do they improve the youth? And Melitus says, uh, yeah, yeah, they do. And then, and then he says, wait a minute, all these people. Well, how about the people that aren't here today? All the other Athenians who are out of town, who are on, uh, on journeys, on diplomatic uh, uh, missions or whatever. Do they all improve the youth? And he says, yeah. So he says, you're basically saying everybody, all citizens of Athens, they all improve the youth except for me. And Melitus says, yeah, uh-huh, sure. They all do. Okay. Um, is that a, is, you think Melitus really believes that? It, or is that even really a, 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 a believable answer? It's not. Yeah, it's pretty unlikely. And Socrates is quick to point that out. He says, if you want to get your car fixed, well, he doesn't say that because there were no cars in ancient Athens, but he makes the point that, look, if you want to get something fixed, you go to a mechanic. If you want to learn how to be trained physically, you go to a physical trainer. You don't just pick any old person. Like, hey, I want to lose weight. Let me go talk to my neighbor who eats Doritos all day and sits on the couch. And maybe he'll show me how to lose weight. No, you go to an expert. You go to somebody who knows how to do this stuff. And so he points that out and, and he says, this just can't be true. But, but why would Melitus say it? I, don't, I really don't think Melitus is that stupid to believe it. Why would he say it then? Why? Well... Let's just imagine him being honest. If Socrates said, hey, those guys on the jury over there, all those men on the jury, and there were a lot of them. I think the jury was like over 100 people. 
all those guys in the jury, they all improved the youth. And then Melitus looked over at all those guys and he said, you know what? There's a couple rascals in there. Most of those dudes are pretty cool, but that guy over there is kind of sleazy. I wouldn't want him hanging out with my sister. That guy over there is kind of sleazy. That Why wouldn't he want to say that? Why wouldn't he just come out and say that? Well, Melitus, remember, Melitus is an accuser. He wants to get Socrates indicted. He wants to get Socrates found guilty. So why wouldn't he say that? Why wouldn't he be like, yeah, that guy, that guy on the jury is kind of sleazy too. He's a corrupter of the youth. Why would he, why, oh, they're all good men. They're all great. Why would he say that? I think that he was kind of backed into a, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say he wouldn't say that because he he would feel like he's proven Socrates correct if he if he uh you know admitted that some of them, you know, aren't good people. Yeah, well, I think yeah, in a way he's showing like, hey, I'm not the only one who corrupts the youth. So in a way, he, like Socrates saying, well, why are you picking on me if I'm not the only corrupter of the youth? Why why are you picking on me? So I guess you got a point there. But but why else? Somebody else is going to say something. Why else wouldn't he want to say, yeah, that guy's a sleaze bag. That guy. Why is he? Being, why is he being like, oh, they're all great. Everyone's great except for Socrates. Why would he say that? Why would he avoid saying the other guys? Are um, I don't think I have anything new. I was just going to phrase it differently. Yeah. <laughs> he well, was backed up, backed into a corner, and he didn't know you know, what else he could possibly say without proving him right. The, yeah, the uh, the way he's portrayed here, it, it seems like he's not that intelligent. So he might just be, like you said, backed in a corner, not sure what to say. But I would say he's avoiding saying anything negative about anybody who's there because he wants them to uh, get Socrates. He wants Socrates to be found guilty. And if he starts saying bad stuff about people in the jury – they're not going to want to vote in his favor. You know, there might be people sitting there in the jury who are like really convinced that Socrates is a scoundrel. And they're really convinced. They're like, yeah, this Melitus guy, uh, I think he's right. This Socrates is a bad influence on our kids. We got to get rid of him. But then he's like, but then Melitus points to the, like, imagine you're on the jury and you're thinking this. And then Melitus points to you and says, yeah, he's just like Socrates. He's a, he's a sleazebag too. You're going to be like, oh, what? Me? Uh, wh wait a minute. I'm not a sleazy. I'm not like Socrates. And then you're going to lose a vote. Um, and so I think what, what Melitus is doing here, it, like you said, he might just be flustered and not know what to say. But he certainly doesn't want to say anything negative about anybody except for Socrates. He wants everybody on his side and everybody else, you know, everybody against Socrates. So he's basically kissing their ass. He's like, oh, everybody improves the youth. Everyone's great. Y'all are all nice. We all it's, it's sort of the politician move. You don't want to alienate any of your voters. So you say, you know, all cops are good. All police officers are great. All, all people that serve in the military are heroes. All, you, know, you don't want to alienate anybody. You want to make sure everybody votes for you. You want to make sure everybody's on your side. So you, everyone's good. Everyone, everyone's great. Everyone improves the youth. Oh, except for this jerk, Socrates. Let's get him, guys. Um, so it's not, it's obviously bullshit and right? it's obviously insincere. Uh, again, he wants to say something that appears, it might sound good. It might be persuasive. It might be something you want to believe, but it's not true. There's no way that even if Socrates is corrupting the youth, the likelihood that he's the only one, uh, that's pretty unlikely. And so this, this seems like a pretty, um, pathetic move on Melitus's part. And I guess maybe further evidence that he's just got a bias. He's biased against Socrates. He just, he hates this guy and he's willing to say whatever to get him in trouble. I kind of wish Socrates would have left it there, to be honest with you, because I think the rest of this, uh, this cross-examination with Melitus, it isn't quite as strong because then he, he makes, to me, he makes some pretty questionable moves in logic here. Because he goes on to, he asks Melitus, he says, well, wait a minute. There's no way I corrupt the youth. Um, he says, there's no way because, well, either I do, but I do it out of ignorance, 
or I don't do it out of all. Dude, I don't do it at all. And so how does he argue for this? He says, well, either I don't corrupt the youth at all, or I do it unknowingly. And why is this? Well, he says, well, here's, here's the deal with corruption. The argument starts something like this. He says, nobody would want to become corrupted. And they all sort of agree, right? Malthus says, yeah, I guess you're right. Nobody would want to become corrupted. All right, well, if that's just true, we all agree. That's sort of the premise that we're going to start with is that no one wants to become corrupted. That's something we all avoid. Um, what would happen if we hung out with people and we, we, we associated with people who are corrupt? What do you think the likely outcome of that is going to be? You know, if you hang out with corrupt people all the time, all your friends are corrupt, all your coworkers, your family, everyone you associate with are all corrupt. What's likely going to happen to you? You're going to meld into yeah. a corrupt person as well. Right. It'll, it'll, eventually you'll become corrupt. So Sakti says, so these, these are basically the two, the two premises he starts with. He says, well, no one wants to be corrupted. And if you associate with corrupt people, you will become corrupt. And so with those two premises, he says, well, then if that's the case, why would I corrupt the youth? There's no way I would do it. If I corrupt the youth, well, I hang out with those guys. The youth, you know, the young, the young people of Athens would always hang out with Socrates, right? They would always follow him around. You know, they love, especially the little rich kids. The rich kids, they love to see him questioning all their rich parents. Look, there's my dad. He's a senator. Go, go talk to him, Socrates. He's a dick. Make him look like a fool, you know? So Socrates is saying, look, if I am corrupting the youth and I'm associating with them, then I would become corrupt as well. And so either I'm not doing it at all because I wouldn't want to corrupt myself, or I do it, but I do it out of ignorance. I do it unknowingly, right? Nobody would knowingly corrupt their associates. And if that's the case, if, you know, let's say I am corrupting them, but I'm doing it out of ignorance. I'm doing it out of stupidity. Should you put me on trial and arrest me for that? He doesn't think so. He thinks what? You, what should, like, if you, if you had a friend who was um, corrupting your other friends, but they didn't realize, like maybe you had a friend who was a part of a multi-level marketing scam or something like that, but they didn't realize that multi-level marketing scams are scams. And they actually thought that they were, you know, making you be an entrepreneur, right? Would you like arrest your friend or call the cops on them? Or what would you, what, what's the best thing to do? According to Socrates. You know, if your friend is doing something bad, but they don't know it's bad, are you going to go tell on them? Are you going to go turn them into the authorities? No, you would. You would talk to them and explain it right. to them. Right. And that's what Socrates says they should do. They say, look, e either I'm not corrupting the youth at all, so you should leave me alone, or if I'm doing it, I'm doing it out of ignorance. And if that's the case, then just pull me aside. Don't put me on trial and try to have me executed, just pull me aside. Say, hey, Socrates, yo, chill. You're corrupting the youth. Oh, sorry, my bad. I'll stop. To me, though, I don't know. I think this argument's kind of suspicious. Anybody else find problems with it before I throw in my, my two cents? It just seems like he's dismantling, like one by one, like all of their uh, arguments. I, I'm not sure. Well, he's trying to. I don't think he's doing that good. Yeah. Well, oh, he's, tr yeah, he's trying yeah, to. Yeah. I think he, I, again, like I said earlier, I think he probably could have stopped, right, when he, when he got Melitus to say that everybody corrupts the youth except for him. That's pretty, like, I think he's already made Melitus look stupid enough and he could have moved on. The, the problem I have with this is that it, the, he's making an assumption that um, nobody ever in the history of the world would ever knowingly corrupt their associates. And I don't know the, I'm not sure what the Greek term is that's being translated as associates, but associate is a pretty broad term in English. So anybody I associate with, coworkers, 
You're telling me in the history of all humanity, nobody has knowingly corrupted their associates? What do you think? No. True, false? No. <laughs> yeah, it's totally, it's totally false. false. Come on. Yeah. Like Enron, all these, you know, hedge fund scandals that you hear about. I mean, there's all sorts of like intentional corruption of people. So I think this is kind of a weak argument, but, but this is just me. I don't think it's very uh, uh, valid. Uh, he's got another argument, though, and this is one where he he says that um, ultimately that Meletus is being inconsistent in his accusations. Uh, he says something like, Meletus, I don't think you can be believed even by yourself, uh, you know, because you're saying contradictory things. Uh, and what is he talking about? He says, well, on the one hand, you seem to be accusing me of atheism, but then you want to say that I teach about spiritual things. And um, Melitus at that point says, yeah, you're an atheist. And here's another point where I, I think Melitus is probably just saying this because he's not really thinking about it. He's not thinking about the logic or anything. He's just sort of like, like Shelley said earlier, he's backed into a corner and he's just throwing the most um, vulgar insult he can on Socrates. And no offense, I'm not a very religious, I'm not religious at all, but to be called an atheist back then was pretty serious. You could actually be executed for atheism. So, um, I think he's just saying, oh yeah, you're an atheist because that's bad. So I want you to be as bad as possible. I'm going to paint you in as bad a light as possible. Again, I, no offense, I'm not religious either, uh, but that's how they thought back then. And so, but Socrates says, look, um, you got to make up your mind. Either I'm an atheist or I teach about spiritual things. Which one is it, you know? Uh, and, and, and they both can't be true. Why can't they both be true? Well, what does it mean to be an atheist? Anyone explain that to me, an atheist? What is atheism? You don't believe in any kind of like religion. I'm sorry, you don't believe in what? In any kind of like religious source, like you don't believe in God or any type of God. Like you're just right. Like yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, you don't believe in any kind of God. It's kind of a, probably not a dictionary definition, but it's to the point, right? You don't believe in spirits, gods, deities, and these sort of things. Um, so he says, well, that's, the, I can't be both. I can't be both an atheist and teaching about spiritual things. Why not? Well, what the heck are we talking about when we talk about spiritual things? He says it's one of two things. Spiritual things are either um well they're either they're either gods or what what's the other uh, option he says in greek mythology i guess you have for those of you that might be familiar with greek mythology you had humans right the mortals uh you had gods and then you have these other beings that were i i guess like in the middle what were they called anybody familiar I guess like in the Christian uh, and like you know, like Jewish, uh, I don't know, yeah, 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 Judeo Christian Muslim, they have angels. They're like spirits in between. But but uh, what about in the Greek mythology? They didn't have angels. What do they have? They're like gods, humans, and then no one knows. No one knows this. I guess they don't teach Greek mythology. Demigod? Yeah, good. He, uh, demigods. That's not the word that's used in our reading, but that's technically correct. So I'll write it. The demigods. I love, I love our reading. Our reading says, the bastard children of gods. <laughs> the bastard children. I'm not making this up. Why, why the bastard children of gods? So they were like half, they were like half God, half human. Why bastards? What's a bastard? All I can think of is jokes. They don't have the, well, the, make a joke. Or, Let's laugh. Their, their father <laughs> yeah, the father's gone. Yeah, Zeus did not pay child support. He was he yeah. was a uh, he was an absent father. You know, Zeus would swoop down to earth and 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 rape some poor innocent maiden, and then he'd split. You know, he would just you know no child support, no stepfather. You know, so 
And and then and then unfortunately the, these people would usually be cursed by his wife Hera. She'd be jealous and curse them or whatever. Uh, yeah, the Greek gods weren't exactly like the most morally uh, exemplar. Uh, they, they weren't the best moral exemplars. Um, but he says, look, let's just say you're talking about spiritual things. Let's say they're either the gods, and if we're talking about gods, then I can't be, I can't teach about spiritual things and be an atheist. That's inconsistent, right? Because if spiritual things are gods, then I'm not an atheist. Well, if spiritual things refers to children of gods, then I still can't be an atheist either. Because is it possible to believe in the children of gods but not believe in the gods themselves? No, yeah. no. So by extension, he can't be an atheist. This is another, to me, kind of stinky, fishy argument. Um, it depends on how you word the darn argument and how you read it, how you interpret it. But if he's all he's saying is that you, you you can't both be an atheist and teach about spiritual things, um, I don't think that's true. I think it's possible to be an atheist, and I mean there there. I knew a guy who was an atheist, and he taught about Christianity. Like he would go around like he was a a, a colleague of mine. I won't name names. I'll try not to give too many details because I don't want to out the guy. But he, when he first, when he first uh, started to study philosophy uh, as an undergraduate, he was very religious. He was a Christian. He was very active in his church. And then about two or three years into his studies, he lost his faith. He became an atheist. But he continued to go around giving speeches about Jesus and how Jesus loves you and Jesus this and Jesus forgives you. And he didn't believe a word of it. And so you could argue that he's teaching of spiritual things, but he didn't even believe any of it. So um, I don't know if this really proves anything that Socrates will, I can't be an atheist if I teach of spiritual things. Eh, maybe you can be, right? Of course, how would we know? You might, you might be just keep it to yourself, but um I've got a bunch of comments here. Okay, all well, oh, this is from earlier. Never mind. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Christy says it. There's people who don't believe and do teach about God. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, there's tons of examples, right? Um, I think there are a lot of spiritual leaders who don't believe either, like priests and stuff. Like, oh yeah. I mean, they have. I, not that I know personally, but I'm pretty sure that they exist. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've heard, you know, there's no way to know, and usually they deny it, but there's been rumors. I know that I'm not a huge fan of Richard Dawkins, even though I'm kind of like, I'm not religious, but he's just, I'm not a huge fan of Dawkins, but Dawkins, does, he's a very uh, critical atheist. He's very critical of religion, and he he claims that he spent a lot of time with these really high bishops in the Catholic Church, like really high up in the Vatican, and he says they don't even believe it. Like, they don't believe it at all. Like, they, they, they believe it's good for other people to believe it. It keeps people in check and makes people moral and makes people doing the right thing. But they don't really believe it, you know. And, and they deny they said that to him. But that's what he says. And I've heard similar things about uh, who's, he, who's the guy that just passed away? Uh, um, uh, his Billy Graham. I heard Billy Graham uh, was like that, uh, that he – he said that to Nixon in the White House, that he said, oh, it's all bullshit. I don't believe any of it, but it's good for the people. You know, it makes the people act and behave and all this sort of stuff. So, uh, yeah, again, I don't know. I, I don't read Billy Graham's mind. Sorry if you're a fan of Billy Graham. I don't want to diss him. But like you said, Shelly, I've heard several stories like this about, you know, people who were famous preachers who didn't believe a word of it, but they made a lot of money doing it. So what the heck? And I remember I used to get really angry. Like I used to give my, this guy, I, I'm not that close to him, uh, but I, you know, I, I bump into him from time to time. And whenever this would come up, I would give him shit about it. I'm like, man, that's messed up. Lou. Like I, I don't even believe that stuff. I'm not religious at all, but like, I couldn't do that. I couldn't stand up in front of a crowd and like preach a bunch of stuff I didn't believe. And, you know, he got real defensive. He's like, Oh man, I make good money. Leave me alone. You know? And, uh, and I still think that's kind of a sleazy answer, but on the other hand, I thought about it, and I'm still, I'm kind of on the fence. I'm like, you know, if if he makes people feel good about themselves and makes them do good things and makes them act good to other people and, and brightens their day, 
I, I don't know. Maybe they're the means justify the the ends justify the means. I, I don't know, right? I'm kind of on the fence about that, but uh, you know, I mean, if they're deceiving, and, pe if they're deceiving people just for money, if they're deceiving people just to like, you know, for success, but if it's you know, if it if it enlightens your day and makes you like a better person, then I don't know. Maybe it was. Justified. I like the idea that it brings communities together, right. and there's a support system and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, I know a lot of the arguments that are in favor of religion. Um, they use statistics to kind of show that um, people that go to church regularly, people that pray regularly, typically have better health. They they have less heart problems, less stress. And I don't really think that has anything to do with spirituality. It just has more to do with what you're talking about. It's like, you've got a support system. You got people that care about you. You've got a sense of community. Uh, you know, if you think that like, maybe there's someone watching out for you, that all that brings about the sense of well-being. To reduced stress or whatever. Right, exactly. Anyway, this is actually, I think, the end of his defense. Like, it's over. He's like done defending himself. So basically... All we get as a defense is the story, right? His sort of investigations, uh, how he went around asking people questions and, and seeking out wisdom and realized that they were all pretenders to wisdom. And then this whole section, which I've been kind of, I've been kind of mean about and kind of picking apart this whole cross-examination of Melitus. Uh, but this is it. This is basically the end of his defense. And at this point in the dialogue, um, I think the tone changes slightly um, he starts to realize that the end is near, right? So they start to get to the sentencing. Uh, he's found guilty. And, um, you know, everybody's kind of like looking at him like what an idiot he is. Like, why, why did he tell us the things he told us? He probably could have gotten off the hook if, if he would have maybe um, asked for a little bit more sympathy. But he's saying things that just, he's making Melitus look like an idiot. He's talking about how everybody else is kind of an idiot. Um, this is on page 31. Um, and he, you know, he's sort of, again, he, 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 I guess at this point he's, he's looking at all the, the people in the jury and all the people in the audience and he, and he sees the look in their eyes of like, what are you doing to yourself, Socrates? Why, why are you saying what you're saying? Why aren't you begging for acquittal? Why aren't you kissing their ass? And again, this is on page 31. He says, someone might say, are you not ashamed, Socrates, to have followed the kind of occupation that has led to your being now in danger of death? However, I should be right to reply to him. You are wrong, sir, if you think that a man who is any good at all should take into account the risk of life or death. He should look to this only in his actions, whether what he does is right or wrong whether he is acting like a good or a bad man. According to your view, all the heroes who died at Troy were inferior people, especially the son of Thetis, who is so contemptuous of danger compared with disgrace. When he was eager to kill Hector, his goddess mother warned him, as I believe, in some such words as these. My child, if you avenge the death of your comrade Patroclus and you kill Hector, you will die yourself, for your death is to follow immediately after Hector's. Hearing this, he despised death and danger and was much more afraid to live a coward who did not avenge his friends. Let me die at once, he said, when once I've given the wrongdoer his deserts, rather than remain here, a laughing stock by the curved ships, a burden upon the earth. Do you think he gave thought to death and danger? This is the truth of the matter, men of Athens. Wherever a man has taken a position that he believes to be best or has been placed by his commander, there he must, I think, remain and face danger without thought for death or anything else rather than disgrace. It would have been a dreadful way to behave, men of Athens, if at Potidaea, Amphipolis, and Delium, these are places where he went to go battle against Sparta for Athens, right? If, if he had, at the risk of death, like anyone else, remained at my post, where those who had elected to command had ordered me, and then when the god ordered me, as I thought and believed, to live the life of the philosopher, to examine myself and others, if I had abandoned my post, 
for fear of death or anything else. That would have been a dreadful thing. And then I might truly have been justly brought here for not believing that there are gods, for disobeying the oracle, and for fearing death, and thinking I was wise when I was not. To fear death, gentlemen, is no other to, than to think oneself wise when one is not, to think one knows what one does not know. So this is, I, to, to, I think this is the first passage where we get his uh, uh, brooding over death. And, and the first thing he mentions is, is how he, you shouldn't care about your death. You know, that everyone there is wondering, why are you doing this, Socrates? You're basically sticking out your neck uh, to be hung and, and you're, you're digging your own grave. And he says, I don't care about death. I don't care about dying. What I care about is living a good life and being a good man and being as good and wise and just as possible. And sometimes that means facing death, just like the people at Troy. You know, he mentions the son of Thetis, Achilles, this great warrior who was told by his mother, the goddess, she knew, you know, she's a goddess. She knew his fate. If you get revenge on your friend Patroclus, you'll get your revenge. You'll kill Hector, but you're going to die immediately after. If you go home and retreat, you'll live a long life with a big kingdom to a ripe old age with many sons. And Achilles said, screw that. I want to get vengeance. I want to get justice. I want to get what's right. So Socrates is sort of comparing himself to Achilles. I'm, I'm going to die, but I'm going to die for what's right. Because death is not what, what you should fear. It's, it's being a coward in the face of danger. It's being unjust, you know, when you have a chance to be just, right? That's what you should be concerned about. And to fear death, as he puts it, is to think you're wise when you're not wise, to think you know what you don't know. Why would he say that? Why, this is where I guess I'll have to end on this today because we're, we're almost out of time, but why would he say that? Why is fearing death thinking you know what you don't know, thinking you're wise when you're not wise? In what way is the fear of death ignorant? I guess it's because, um everybody everybody's gonna die soon or everybody's gonna die at some point so it's like being being scared of that is like it's like so unrealistic because everybody's gonna die right it's unavoidable yeah i'm not really quite sure that's his main point but that's certainly a good point and i think he he sort of emphasizes that towards the end i think what he's hinting out here though is that like so we all know we're gonna die but do we, does anybody know? Doesn't know what's going to happen at, in the afterlife. Right, you know, right. That's, that's what he's trying to say. That's right. like with the civil rights movement. You had a lot of those men, MLK, just an example. Yeah. He didn't fear death. He knew what he was doing. He felt was the right thing. Right. So I'm going to do what I feel is right, even if I have to get assassinated and die for right. it, even though I know y'all want to kill me for it. So right. that's what right. he was trying to say. No, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, and MLK was greatly influenced by Socrates. I don't know if you've ever read the letter from Birmingham jail, but you know, he talks about this. You know, I have. I've got, yes, I've got to I've got to do what's right. You know, this might not be good for my neck, but this is what I need to live for. Right. This is you know something higher. And, and so for him. Uh, and again, and back to your original uh, comment, no one knows. Right. Like, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Anybody in here ever died before? I, I've never died, so I don't know what it's like, right? Um, but we all act like it must be something bad. So Saki says, how do we know it's something bad? How do we know it might be something good? It might not be anything at all, but we all act like it's bad, right? But we've never, maybe someone's like died and come back. Any near-death experiences here? No, nothing. <laughs> I didn't think so, right? Uh, but yeah, so no one knows for sure. So for him, it's, you know, thinking you know and you don't know. And and, uh, and this is this is the theme. Uh, and and like, like I said earlier, the dialogue, it starts to get a little bit more serious. I think, you know, Saki, is having some fun now and kind of poking at his uh, his accusers but once he starts to realize look you guys are really going to kill me for this uh he starts to get a little more serious and he starts to talk about again what it really means to live a good life and what you should care about and what you should stand for and it's not always what's best for you i guess for your mortality uh but it's you know important to be just i suppose to stand up for what's right and i'm going to stop recording now so it's over here